Okay, ha hello everyone. So it's uh, 12 o'clock Los Angeles time, three o'clock Ottawa, two o'clock Winnipeg and uh, elsewhere uh, slightly later. So good afternoon, good morning, good night to some of our colleagues. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Sarah and Doc are my co-anchors for session four. We have very successful se session one, session two and session three. And uh, after my talk, uh, Christina is going to welcome us and give us some facts about the previous activities of our transformational impacts of information technologies. So for today's webinar, please always keep your microphones muted. Use your real name, change your name by clicking on the three dots and select rename. Feel free to say hello through the Zoom chat. We will be using Miro for additional interaction. A link will be provided shortly. And Miro is our board where we have all the information for this event. Be kind and cautious. Uh, note that this webinar is being recorded. And also note that session four will be the same as session one, two, and three. It's just a repeat of the sessions with a little bit twist, okay? So the next slide. So now let me introduce you to our coordinator, Christina Cameron for opening remarks. Thank you, Mario. And um, on behalf of our World Heritage, I welcome everyone to our third event of this year. This is the second webinar for the theme of transformational impacts of information technology, which is one of the 12 monthly debates of, on World Heritage issues that's been held throughout 2021. The Our World Heritage Initiative aims to mobilize citizens and professionals to support better heritage protection. The purpose of those monthly debates is to raise general awareness about the significance of our natural and cultural world heritage sites and to call attention to critical pressures from unsustainable development activities, climate change, of course, civil unrest and other issues. The initiative hopes to provide opportunities for the involvement of civil society in finding innovative and sustainable solutions. So the theme, if you remember, those of you who came to the first one, the, the IT theme opened with Globinar 1 in January of this year. And it was an incredible 23 hour marathon with over 900 participants from all around the world. For the IT team, this was the beginning of building a global network of organizations, professionals, and individuals. And then we had a webinar on February 6th, and there we announced the nine shortlisted contestants out of 36 submissions for our global competition. So we took the opportunity to share also to share feedback on the policy recommendations from the first webinar discussions. So today, this is the fourth session, as Mario says, this is the fourth session of Globinar 2. We hope to get your input and feedback during the panel discussions on the three key toolkit elements. Our aim is to develop a toolkit that we can put in the hands of heritage practitioners in order to harness information tools uh, to improve conservation and interpretation of heritage places. And later today, there's going to be a closing event and that starts at eight o'clock my time, five o'clock San Francisco time. So at the closing event, we're going to announce the winners of the global competition. I hope you can join us. I wish to express my appreciation for the time and efforts of all those 36 teams and thank them for sharing their ideas and expertise with us. It's been very helpful. And in particular, I want to thank our industry partners, Capturing Reality, Sintu, Elucidar, Time Looper, World Sensing, and Zoller Fondlich, who generously offered prizes for the competition. So on the behalf of the co-conveners of the IT theme, Mario and Haifa Abdel Halim, I thank the many members of our team for making Globinar 2 a reality. And I want to warmly welcome each of you. We look forward to hearing your valuable ideas and thoughts. So welcome and back to you, Mario. Thank you, Christina, for your kind words. Um, always there to help us and be our wisdom in this initiative. So uh, before we continue into the into the practices of this uh, uh, webinar, please uh, rename yourself. We, we want you to use your real name. Also, please put which of the three breakup rooms you are going to be attending. So breakup room one is going to be dealing with capacity building, networking, 
data management and open source data. And this one is going to be, Sara Shikon is going to be the share of this, of this uh, panel. Then we have panel two, tools for monitoring and interpretation. Doc Prisha is managing this one. Y luego el panel tres, que va a ser en castellano, aquellas personas que quieran contribuir a este panel, tienen que colocar el tres eh, antes de su nombre y colocar su nombre verdadero. Muchísimas gracias. Ok, so let's go to the next slide. So we have a great opportunity today. After the sessions, after the breakout rooms, so we will come back for a short time to the plenary and then you would have the opportunity to do a one-to-one -one talk to some of our experts that have volunteered kindly their time to talk to you. So please use the link that will be provided to you on the chat box, which is this one, calendi.com, et cetera. And there you will be able to book the experts. And let me just give you an overview of the experts that are looking to talk to you. So we have Christina Cameron, expert in World Heritage Systems, and Christina Hills, a Canada held a Canada research chair in Bill Heritage at the University of Montreal between 2005 and 2019, where she directed a research program on heritage conservation. She served as a heritage executive with Parks Canada for many, many years. And she has worked extensively with the World Heritage Convention in 1987. In particular, she shared the World Heritage Committee in 1990 and 2008. So, and she also has co-authored many books. Then we have Daniele Paulino, who is a PhD candidate for the Pennsylvania State University. He's an expert in adaptive reuse of heritage structures. So I really recommend to sign up with Dan da Danny, who is a really an emerging professional in our field. So the next expert is Katie Graham. Katie is a media production and designer at Carleton University, expert in digital storytelling and virtual reality. Katie actually, talks in all my guest lectures that have to do with uh, digital storytelling. I really encourage you to sign up for Katie. Next one. Mohamed Raki Salim, or Raki, is a graduate researcher at the Pennsylvania State University. He's an expert in eye tracking as means of for documentation. For those of you who would like to look into emerging tools for capturing information about heritage, you sure should make an appointment with Raki after the sessions. Next one. And then we have our own Rebecca Napolitano, member of our evaluation committee at this initiative, core member of our team, but she's an assistant professor at the Pennsylvania State University. She's an expert in structural health monitoring and data collection. Uh, Becca has an extensive knowledge about uh, a district, discrete element modeling and other techniques in a structural evaluation of historic buildings and I'm sure that you will enjoy talking to her. So sign up for Becca. And I think these are our experts. So please do not uh, miss this opportunity to sign up. They are really looking to talk to you for, and each of the appointments is about 10 minutes. So you have some time to talk to them. All right, so now uh, let's go to the Miro uh, platform. You can sign up to Miro using the link that is going to be provided to you. And in Miro, you can, put your, you can actually interact with us. So you can put your ideas, you can take a post-it and put your ideas and so on. So to get started with Miro, you need to put your name, your work uh, email or your email of preference, and then the password. So please use your, your real name so you, we know who you are in Miro. So the next one, please. So if you wanna add information, you can add a sticky note or you can make a comment next to the point that uh, you, you would like to, to comment, okay? And this is done by using the tools at the left side of Miro. And you can see there the sticky note or the comment. And you can, uh, well, uh, we have locked most of the Miro board because uh, in the past, uh, in our Globinar one, we had this, this fortune <laughs> that somebody erased half of, the, half of the board. But this time we have locked most of it. But if you make a small mistake, you can always undo by doing control set or just going into the Miro icons and then press on that little arrow you see there in the, in the screen. Okay, so the next one. Now we, uh, we are going to conduct a quick uh, poll. Um, I don't remember exactly who is helping me with the poll or is it me? So let's go to the poll actually. 
So what we want to do is if you click on the link that is provided to you on the left, uh, it, this will open a window and you will be able to put your input on the poll. Okay, so let's start with the first question of this uh, poll. And I think that Daniel has to, to change. Uh, I think he has to stop sharing and then sharing the... I was about to share and then I don't know if someone is in the back end on poll everywhere right now, but the poll appears to have disappeared. Oh. Um, so what I think we'll do um, is yes, re it. Oh no, now it's appearing. Now the poll is there. Yeah, okay. I am in the poll. Great. Yes. Now is the poll is there. Hi, Claudia. Um, okay. So while you are sharing the, the responses, Daniel, uh, what you're gonna see on your poll screen from where you're joining us, and please put your country. Let's see where everybody's coming from. I don't remember it, where I'm coming from because I, it has been a really long day with many sessions. Okay, so we have people from Los Angeles, Alberta, United, Zambia, Jersey, Boulder, Beirut, I guess this is United Kingdom, right? Uh, Colombia, wow, we have a very international Americas oriented and but also from other continents. And of course, if you feel that you're coming from many places, you can put all the places you're coming from, okay? No worries. So we're gonna keep this for a couple of seconds and then we're gonna, I think we have a, a next poll, right, uh, Daniel? Yes, we should. So I'll, yeah. I'll so let's up. let's see. Wow, great. So we have a really international group of people. So let's go to the next uh, poll. All right. So which topics did you come to hear about discuss today in one or two words? So I know what I came to do today. I came to networking. Okay. So I was. I like that word, networking. Capacity building, diagnostics, monitoring. I hope that we will fulfill your wishes in the session four. I think that so far we have fulfilled the wishes of all the people in the different uh, sessions. So as I, I will reiterate, this is our session four. Uh, and we had a session one started in Asia, session two moved to Europe, session three, dealt with Arab states and Africa. And now we are in session four, broadcasting from the East Coast of the Americas. All right, so we have very good, uh, um, very good keywords. Uh, hope, as I said, I hope we meet all your expectations. Great. So I think that we can, we can stop the poll and then we can move on to our next activity. So, I'm just going to wait for Daniel. Thank you, Daniel, for your hard work. Yes, so we are going to hear from Douglas Preacher. Let me introduce you my co-anchor and great friend, Douglas Preacher, who is a graduate architect from Canada. He's also a senior research fellow at Cyprus University of Technology in the area of 3D visualization, lecturer at Job Hoskins University in Cultural Management Master's Program, specialized in the creation of interactive virtual environments, immersive 3D experiences, and customized software development. Directed numerous in innovative large-scale 3D and new media projects in Canada, Scotland, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and the United States. Previous projects include the Cologne Cathedral, UNESCO World Heritage Site, CERN, Urban Model for Glasgow, and the Scottish STEM project. And also, uh, DOC is our chair for the uh, industry committee that we have in our initiative. So the floor is yours, Doc. Thank you for talking to us. Uh, thanks, Mario. And uh, thank you, Christina, for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Um, I have the topic of transboundary, um, the issue of transboundary. And initially, I, I think I was uh, given this opportunity, if you want to switch to the next slide. 
uh, in part due to the fact that I've been very, very fortunate to work on a whole bunch of projects around the world. I'm not entirely sure how this happened. Um, I'm actually, I was born in Winnipeg, Canada, which is uh, a very kind of uh, out of the place type of city, but um, by moving to Toronto and then eventually to Glasgow, Scotland, I've been involved with a whole bunch of projects. Um, and I do want to, you know, point out, uh, these are projects that I did while working as an associate professor at uh, Glasgow School of Art or at Harriet Watt University uh, in Scotland, working with Historic Environment Scotland, uh, including uh, David Mitchell and Chris McGregor, um, James Hepner, um, also working with SciArc and Liz Lee and uh, with the amazing Ben and Barbara Casira. Um, also projects with the University of Glasgow, Cologne Cathedral, Fresnius University, um, and then recent projects, which was really cool, was with the University of Rome at Sapienza, and then, as mentioned, also with the Cyprus University of Technology. So these are the range of projects that I've done, uh, certainly transboundary in terms of geography, um, being in a variety of different countries. And from that, uh, clearly gaining experience as an architect and as a kind of 3D surveyor, I guess, um, and bringing that into uh, all aspects of my work. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So one of the biggest projects that I've been involved with was the urban model of Glasgow. Uh, not, I typed in urban mode. Um, now, this was a massive project. It was done almost uh, 12 years ago. Uh, basically, the digital recording of over 1,400 buildings in the uh, center of Glasgow. Uh, a great opportunity um, to start using a laser scanner, probably one of the first groups of people in the UK to use the Leica terrestrial laser scanner. And uh, myself and a team from the Glasgow School of Art went through and scanned and built a virtual representation of the city. Uh, if you could just jump to the next one. Um, during that project, I was introduced to uh, David Mitchell and Chris McGregor at Historic Environment Scotland or Historic Scotland at the time. And one of the first projects we did was Stirling Castle, uh, again, using a laser scanner. And it was really a, a, a fantastic push by David and Historic Scotland to apply scanning uh, to heritage structures throughout Scotland. Um, at the time, you know, there was still a battle between kind of a battle between scanning and photogrammetry. Um, but David really pushed the scanning and in particular pushed the 3D aspect of uh, recording. Uh, just to the next slide. So I'm just giving you a sample of the work. Um, this was uh, an early project, which was Roslyn Chapel, which is a tiny little building um, south of Edinburgh. Um, an interesting project, uh, not entirely because of the scanning, but just the fact that the, the chapel has a number of challenges. And that seems to be consistent with a lot of the projects that I work with. Uh, the imposition of tourism and uh, tourist management at a site and looking at using the 3D and the multimedia as a form of engaging people before they go into the building um, to give them a better uh, experience. But on the other hand, there was the engineering component that went with the scanning, which included uh, looking at the structural aspects of the vault. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, through Historic Scotland uh, and actually through uh, a Leica event, I was very fortunate to meet uh, Ben Kassira and Kassira. And he, at that time, was just launching the SciArc 500. Uh, unfortunately, Liz Lee isn't here today. Um, but I was, that's where I first met Liz, and uh, the first project that we worked on was laser scanning Mount Rushmore. Um, next slide. So you're noticing different countries, different places, um, different heights. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then expanding upon that project, uh, this was the Scottish 10 through David Mitchell, where teams of people would, uh, from the art school and from Historic Scotland, would travel. Um, the idea was to document the five Scottish World Heritage Sites and five international sites. Uh, the first one was um, uh, Mount Rushmore, not a World Heritage Site, but a heritage site nevertheless. Uh, Rani Kivav at the time was not a World Heritage Site. And then there was other sites in China and Japan that were included. Next slide, please. 
Uh, one of the most amazing places that I've ever been in my life is a uh, tiny little island, the most remote island in Britain called St. Kilda, which is just this crazy, crazy place. And uh, I don't have the time to get into it, but it is uh, uh, just the history behind that island is absolutely remarkable. Uh, next slide. Um, more recently, so if we could just, this one and the next one, if you could just go through that. So Cologne Cathedral, very complex project. CERN, uh, a recent project. Uh, CERN was in the news recently about the, the results of one of their experiments, and that experiment occurred in the center of that long horizontal rod, which is pretty cool. Um, and next slide. So, okay, um, I've got 10 minutes, so I want to be... I'm going to be, I have to be very brief, unfortunately. Um, looking at trans boundary issues, I, you know, beyond the fact that, you know, I've been able to travel with the documentation technologies and work with different state agencies around the world, uh, the trans boundary, the main trans boundary issues for me deal with the level of, of um, data quality and trying to establish a certain level of standards um, among uh, the various projects. So um, one thing that is very interesting is at the Cyprus University of Technology, we recently won a tender by the European Commission to do a study on the quality of tangible cultural heritage. And we're looking at issues like data quality um, and uh, um, methods of recording, the processing, the versatility of data and data preservation. All these are very important. And what I think is, is interesting is that by establishing certain standards and methods and degrees of determining quality, there is an establishment of an international language. So then that, I would argue, then becomes transboundary. Um, the problem that we're having, um, a very exciting problem, but a difficult problem is that, that right now there are just too many devices on the market. Um, everyone is getting into 3D more so than before. You know, there's not only laser scanners, but photogrammetry and drones. And now when you hear of, uh, you know, Apple coming out with um, uh, on the iPad, the capability of doing 3D, what are the standards of this data um, and how this data can be repurposed, not just for something um, in an engineering way, but also in uh, for uh, heritage preservation. Um, next slide, please. So what we're looking at with this um, deals with quality and complexity. So uh, addressing issues of accuracy, resolution and error. Um, part of the problem is that this that this whole world has grown um, organically, and what I consider accurate data may not be uh, what you consider uh, accurate. Or the issue of error. Error is very important if you're a surveyor, knowing the level of error, and that kind of has disappeared. Plus, you have an issue with things like um, uh, um, uh, some of the 3D apps now, where you can generate really fantastic. Uh, photorealistic 3D models, but are they dimensionally accurate or are they enough to be considered survey grade? And do you know what you're looking at how, to take that back to the original source data? So all of that stuff is very important. And I did, I did was fortunate to speak at the first uh, Globinar and the thing for me is the foundation data. Getting that right initially and then, um, and then building from that, build a narrative from it. Um, the last thing I'm going to touch upon in terms of transboundary um, is really the transboundary collaboration between the object monument or site with the narrative of the site and the story. And I think that's extremely important. And what I think is exciting and also very challenging uh, is the whole uh, emergence of augmented reality and mixed reality. Uh, that is coming into play, the way that you can uh, uh, combine a narrative to a 3D object um, or combine a narrative to the actual object uh, virtually, I think is, is very exciting and that will be the future, um, you know, moving forward. So that, that very exciting. And just looking at things like recently, you know, with game engine companies such as uh, Unreal, they recently purchased Capturing uh, Reality, which is one of our software supporters. So there's some really cool stuff that is happening in that regard. But at the same time, we have to be careful. You know, I, I do think when looking at transboundary issues, looking at the, uh, the, the standards of the data 
to, to provide a timeless data set that is survey grade accurate if at all possible or knowing that it's not, um, and then integrating it into other data sets. And uh, uh, last thing, oh yeah, another one that I have to point you to. Um, yeah, you could just finish up uh, as we're as that's going through. Um, is Sintu another fantastic tool, which is one of our su supporters? And this, I think, is also transboundary. You know, by putting data onto a cloud um, and then having that cloud shared among a variety of partners, uh, you know, be it in North America or in Europe or in other parts of the world, I think that's a fantastic thing. And that that cloud and the three visualization and interface becomes the main communication uh, portal. Um, and that is it for me, Mario. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, you know, your your lecture has really kind of enlightened, you know, the transboundary collaboration that we can establish. And that's one of the objectives of this meeting too, is to bring new collaborations together to find common goals. So let's go to our next speaker, uh, Patricia Donnell. Well, many people know Patricia. I know Patricia from ICOMOS, from our uh, International Scientific Committee on Culture Landscapes, and, and, uh, and she is the president of this committee. And she's also now recently elected president of the board of our World Heritage Foundation. So congratulations on that, Patricia. And Patricia is a preservation landscape architect and an urban planner. She founded Heritage Landscapes LLC in 1983. It is, sorry, 1987. This professional firm has completed a diverse group of 500 commissions that have received 92 awards that foster preservation and enable economic, environmental, and societal sustainability for valued places, particularly cultural landscapes. The American Society of Landscape Architects awarded Heritage Landscapes, Preservation Landscape Architects and Planners the 2019 firm award, its highest honor. Patricia's involvement in over 600 community park corridors, state museums, military sites, cemeteries, cemeteries, and historic sites projects has successfully addressed reservation and renewal and contributed innovative approaches for diverse communities in the United States and beyond. Of the master planning projects take the form of cultural landscapes report with, with treatment, implementation, and management guidance. Patricia has led the development of over 100 and 10 cultural landscape planning reports that serve as a foundational documents for public landscape stewardship and rehabilitation. Holding master's degree in landscape architecture and urban planning, uh, Patricia has contributed to ASLA, ICOMOS, IFLA, and UNESCO's World Heritage to advance the valued landscapes heritage of diverse cultures. O'Donnell collaborated with global colleagues on the development and mainstreaming of the UNESCO recommendations on historic urban landscapes, or non hul 2011 and has incorporated the whole approach in revitalizing heritage cities nationally and internationally. Her work at Heritage Landscapes applies planning and implementation expertise to the preservation and ongoing stewardship of remarkable legacy of value places of local, regional, national, and global importance. Her contributions demonstrate a deep commitment to bringing professional skills to sustaining and revitalizing our common of historic places, as do fellow recognition honors from the ASLA and the US ICOMOS. Patricia, the floor is yours, and we are very eager to listen to your lecture. You're the ideal person to talk about this topic. Greetings, everyone who's participating in this IT webinar, and thank you for the invitation to present on the nature culture intersection. This image is an example from the Andean route with people walking it and then the um, mapping showing all the sites along that route powered by Esri. So clearly uh, we're in a time where a corridor of this size would be um, managed through mapping. Just a couple of points to augment what Christina said. Our World Heritage works as an integrator. We're linking themes, regions, people, generations, understanding issues, bringing forward corresponding solutions in order to advance the protection of the Earth's cultural and natural treasures. We seek diverse and inclusive voices, and certainly that's been the case with the previous webinar and in this one. 
and our hope through 2021 is to shape, shape a series of thematic debates for co-learning and knowledge building. This is a voluntary coalition of concerned individuals and we're preparing to bring forward some findings for the 2022 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. In looking at culture and nature, I would suggest that they permeate environment, economy, and society, and that an easy shift from the term resources, which considers human extraction, moves us to the term assets, where heritage, both cultural and natural, is inherently valuable. This view of Rio shows us not only the distinctive massifs, <clears throat> beach, and uh, frontage of the sea, it also shows us the favelas on the hill. I come from a landscape architecture and planning discipline and think about heritage as place specific while often large in scale. This view captures the reality of an evolved cultural landscape, the inscribed 2012 Carioca landscape between the sea and the mountains. We use a series of aspects, character defining or contributing features when we look at landscape. And these are those aspects of the physical, tangible heritage. When we think about the intangible heritage, I give you here a view of San Juan Chimula in Mexico, a living Mayan village. There are many aspects of the intangible and that the tangible cultural and natural heritage serves as a vessel or a platform for the human expression of the intangible. Documentation, of course, is a baseline led by local voices and values, and IT has a role in helping that documentary process. Intangible and tangible can coexist, as the example here of the Asun Asgobo sacred grove in Nigeria, that is a symbol of identity for the Yoruba people. Let me shift to a diagram I've been working on for a while. Uh, heritage does combine cultural diversity and biodiversity. The first version of this, which isn't quite what I'm going to be showing you, came from the IUCN and IGMO's Connecting Practices Initiative. So we have biological and cultural diversity, and there's clearly an overlap. When we think about the biological side, we not only are talking about natural habitats, but we're talking about human-shaped habitats. When we shift to the cultural side, we're looking at tangible heritage and intangible heritage. So let me suggest that if we move forward to diversity in nature, we should look also at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, and approved in 1992, 20 years after the World Heritage Convention. And note that this talks about the intrinsic value of biological diversity and ecological genetic, and then a series of human-based um, statements, social, economic, scientific, educational, cultural, recreational, and aesthetic value. The images here are of a mixed World Heritage Site, the Blue and John Crow Mountains. If we look at the protected planet, uh, which is nature in all the IUCN categories, we see a considerable coverage, 16.25% of the terrestrial world and 7.71% of the marine. And these areas store 15% of the global terrestrial carbon stock so they are clearly economic assets and they support the livelihoods of over a billion people. An example of a recent nomination is the migratory bird sanctuaries along the coast of the Yellow Sea in the Gulf of China. And this is an area that doesn't necessarily respect 
state party boundaries. Basically, it's a place where the birds are flying over and using. So when we talk about biodiversity and cultural diversity, if we unite them, we're talking about the engagement of all the heritage assets. So if you search for indigenous, uh, the word indigenous on the World Heritage website, what you find is a number of elements, but they include nine mixed World Heritage sites. And these are particularly interesting because they do combine and are nominated for that combination of habitat and uh, human heritage and biological and cultural diversity. So while I've presented this as symmetrical, the diagram is not actually symmetrical in accordance with the uh, September review from the UN biodiversity meeting, they indicated that 75% of the terrestrial surface was human shaped. And we also know that the more than a thousand world heritage sites, as well as those sites that are important at state party levels are tangible heritage and those are more frequent than the intangible. There are actually 584 elements listed on the intangible heritage list. Uh, and that convention uh, brings us forward at least on that effort to recognize the intangible. So let me apply this to a project. I think the nature culture piece really needs a bit of a highlight on the human shaped habitats. This is a project we did in Jackson Park in Chicago in the US. Uh, it addresses an important site of the 1893 World Columbian Exposition. And this is the 1897 planting plan for the park. The project addresses ecological restoration, social inclusion, and historic preservation together in an integrated design approach. For this project, we looked at the existing landscape with the overall loss of homestead character, weak flora and fauna, a dysfunctional circulation system, and poor and degraded scenery, as well as the perception that the park was unsafe. And the bottom of this frame is a simulation we did to present to uh, the community, and it shows an enriched habitat diversity and expanded path network added overlooks and fishing access, wide views, and improved safety because there's improved visibility. The project was a um, close collaboration with the Army Corps of Engineers. The source of funding was Habitat, but there were important aspects of historic review that needed to be met for the State Historic Preservation Office to approve it. So the colored areas on this frame show what we shaped. Uh, the yellow is the added circulation to make the park function better for the community. This is a sample of the very detailed and complex planting plan where we used Olmsted organizational structure and uh, created a series of some 60 different groups of plantings. The park was in a degraded condition before we started. Those images are shown on the left and on the right is a, an after image from the project. And here uh, a clip showing the organization of an area that was degraded because during the Cold War they truncated this lagoon because they took away part of the park to put Nike missiles in the park so they wanted to return land area. So clearly history is not always kind to public parks. So to the degree possible, we enlarged the lagoon, reshaped it, brought a path along it, and created um, a much more interesting walking experience and access as well as habitat. So the big issues here um, really are creating a park for all communities. Uh, there's 
social inclusion, there's environmental justice. This is Southside Chicago with um, a neighborhood with prim primarily African-American residents and uh, a significant degree of challenges uh, socially and in terms of justice. Let me just end by saying that uh, to have an inclusive future for cultural and natural heritage, we need to integrate the UN Sustainable Development Goals and targets. I hope you're all working with these. And the inseparable culture and nature, how can heritage IT help with this important issue? Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. I I, I think that all the points that you have raised, you know, about the integration, the inseparability of nature and culture is actually really evidenced by your professional experience and that community of practice as we have been talking. So thank you so much for your uh, lecture.